Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for our first virtual alumni skills series. This series connects you to experts in a variety of skills and activities, and today is going to be a blast learning about the basics of kiteboarding. Well, my name is Molly Clevin, and I'm from the University of Minnesota Duluth Alumni Relations team. Today, we are going to learn about riding the winter wind using a kiteboard with a demonstration from UMD RSOP staff. Now to introduce our guests. Today, we will hear from Randy Carlson and Anna Burgraff. Randy serves as the UMD Recreational Sports Outdoor Program Coordinator of Whitewater Paddling, Surfing, Stand-Up Paddling, and Snow Kiting Programming. His world revolves around the outdoor exploration in the wind and on the water. His mantra is, if it's windy, we respond with kites. If it floats, he's tried it or really looks forward to trying it, especially on rivers or in the surf zone. Much of his energy over the past 40 years has been spent sharing wind and water sport knowledge with others. The thrill of gliding, weightlessness, and acceleration never gets old, no matter what sport you choose. Anna is a UMD sophomore studying healthcare management. She has been kiting off and on since she was 12 years old and is still hooked on it today. Currently, Anna teaches snow kiting for UMD RSOP with Randy and loves every minute of it. I'm now going to hand it over to Randy and Anna. Thank you, Molly. Thanks, Molly. All right, we're gonna travel 16 miles north of Duluth to Island Lake. And that uh, offers us a snowmobile uh, for support um, because my mom has a place on the lake. And our environment, winter environment is great out there. It's a big lake. We, uh, we should point out that for winter kiteboarding, there's a lot of risks to be managed. So this presentation does not replace in-person instruction. You'll, you'll need some help if you're going to get into this sport with a friend or an instructor. But in the environment, we measure the wind with an anemometer. That top number, 13.5, is the wind at the present time. 32 in the middle is the peak gust. And so that variation um, is you know, more than double understanding that uh, wind, when the wind speed doubles, the force quadruples is really important. So we have to choose the right kites. Our students are getting harnesses on. They're wearing winter clothing as though they'd go to an alpine ski and snowboard area. They uh, park on the causeway and with the snowmobile and a water ski rope, uh, we bring them to the launch area that is uh, sheltered, south facing. That's kind of nice if you can achieve that. You've got to be humble and alert uh, with this sport. And we're using leading uh, foil kites that are four line sheetable foils where the leading edge has an open cell and leading edge inflatable kites that you pump up. Those work great on the water. Now, when flying your kite, um, it's usually like the most important and first rule when learning how to kite. And this is typically in technical terms called piloting. And so when piloting the kite, it is attached to you with your harness. As you can see, there's a metal spreader bar that is attached to both Will and Randy. And um, so you take the chicken loop, which is located just below the bar of the strings. Um, you attach that onto your spreader bar. And that is how you are in one with the kite. Now, along with that, um, your hand placement on the bar is very important. The bar has two different colors on two different sides. On the left side, it is usually always red. And with um, the kites in this program, on the right side, it is always blue. Now, when flying your kite, you always want to make sure that the left hand is in the right and the right hand is in the blue because um, if your kites get spun around or anything, or you have that backwards, you can run into some problems. Now, along with that, you can see um, attached on the far edges of the bar are the power lines. And that's what you use when you steer the bar. That's the lines that are controlling the kite. In the middle of the bar, there's lines, and those are call called the power lines. Now, as you can see, based off the anemometer, the wind can change drastically throughout the day. And instead of always constantly putting a kite down and like picking up new ones, there's um, thick webbing right in the middle 
that as you can see, and there's a red strap attached to it, and that is called your trimmer strap. And to do that, you just pull on that strap and you can depower your kite if you're too powered up. And that way you can have less power, still be able to kite comfortably, but you don't have to go and put your kite down. Other features of this system include with foil kites more specifically is the brake. And the brake you can see is a string that connects the two outer steering lines. And pulling the brake with foil kites, you would use it more for situations where you know, you're coming in from a session and you're um, self landing it, uh, you kind of like fell or something, you just kind of want that kite to drop a little bit. Like any situations where it's not as serious, but you still want that kite to come down to the ground. Now in more serious situations, um, you would use the top red hat, which you can see right above the bar it's that little knob and honestly it looks like a red hat and if we want to continue with the video we can see a, another situation called bow tying in this video you can see the kite is being bow tied it's flipping around blake will then pull the top hat and go through the series of self-rescuing in order to fix that situation on his own so then he does not always need the help of other people and continue on. So we like to start people on these open cell four line cheatable foils. Eventually you're gonna to need to move with your kite on a crosswind reach. So we start walking with the kite um, perpendicular to the wind and try to do one handed steering. So if you let go with your upwind hand, you're able to balance with that hand and still steer the kite uh, with just one hand. Now it's important to look at where you're going uh, as opposed to just staring at the kite up in the, in the sky. Because you do have to monitor the terrain in front of you. And um, this is particularly true if there's a mix of snow and ice early in the season. So there's a lot going on. You're trying to uh, steer the kite using steering inputs that resemble mountain biking or a shopping cart. Everything you learned about a steering wheel uh, will not apply. Um, we actually let go of the bar and spin it to take the cross out of the lines. Uh, but to actually steer the kite, it's a, it's a push-pull with your hands level, very similar to a mountain bike or a shopping cart. And the, the hand you pull in on uh, pulls on that, the steering lines on that side. It backstalls the trailing edge of the kite on that side and causes it to turn. As you can see here, um... Blake was ready to go, so he popped on his skis. Um, he's more so parking his kite in the air, kind of keeping it more um, in one spot versus doing continuous power strokes where some people do it constantly all the time. But he's still doing a little bit just to maintain that forward momentum. And he's, his back foot is a little bit more forward causing him to angle his skis a little bit more and just really leaning and edging. So now if you don't have any experience with skis or a snowboard prior to hopping on a kite, it is okay. So one way that we do to combat that is we, with the ski rope that is attached to small snowmobile, we will have you pop on your skis or snowboard and practice that edging that you will do behind a kite. So instead of just whipping behind the snowmobile like you would on a wakeboard or something, we want you to intentionally practice those skills. For instance, that would be um, practicing your heel edge and edging behind the kite with your snowboard as you will see Quinn doing here. And just by doing that, she's gonna bend her knees, kind of bend it and go back and forth a little bit. And if we want a funny story of the cattails while Randy pulls you behind the snowmobile, you kind of want to watch out for that, those, because there's been some times where I was having some fun behind it and I went right into the cattail patch, which is right um, between the island and the causeway. 
And going through those, I've had fuzzies all over my face, all over my body, in my mouth, just everywhere. So, you know, not the worst thing in the world to go through those, but just keep in mind if you got those that um, they are there, they are very apparent. And if you fall into those, you will be covered in fuzz. Here's our uh, leading edge inflatable kite at the launch area. They hold their shape. Uh, so you have to put a backpack or some snow on that kite to, to keep it down. Another thing too is if you can see that flag blowing kind of farther in the screen, that's another tool that we use for while you're kiting or even just walking out to actually truly um, visualize fully um, where the wind direction is exactly. And even when I'm cutting myself, if I get a little bit mixed up, it always helps ground me by looking at the flag, making sure my back is completely to the wind, and then putting my kite right in the wind window to make sure I'm fully centered. So it, has, it is a great feature to have out on the lake with you. The edging that occurs uh, with a snowboard, you have just the one edge, either heel side, or you can ride toe side, but the independent leg action of alpine skis gives you two working edges at any given time. So it's a little easier to uh, hold your edge edges uh, on skis against the kite than it is with the snowboard. Leading edge inflatable kites require you to attach your lines to the bridles at the kite every time you use the kite. And the foil kites have the lines attached to the bridles um, already. So there's, there is a difference in the rigging at the launch site. The main thing with the uh, LEIs is when it's really cold, you've got uh, more stress on those components. Um, Sub-zero temperatures agree more with foil kites than the leading edge inflatable kite. As you kite, you can see that um you want your body lean to be away from the kite and kind of just edgy more. So both in terms of you want those kite strings to be tight and like have a lot of force. So then if it's loose, your kite is more likely to drop as well as when you do edge away from the kite um, and lean your body over more, you are more likely to fall upwind which is a more desired spot to fall. And it's easier to pop back up if you're in that position. Another thing to keep in mind when kiting is it's not just your body that you have to worry about now. It is your body, the kite strings, and the kite as a whole. So you take up a lot more space than you normally would. So you always have to keep that in mind when you are thinking about your buffer from potential objects that could cause you harm. So one instance of that that people usually run into is obviously trees. Now at the lake, no matter what side the wind or, or what direction the wind is coming from, there's always going to be trees typically in your way. So if you see, if you are coming up, you're getting pulled down wind and you see that you know, from you, your strings and your kite, if you go get dragged down a little bit more farther, your kite's gonna end up in the tree. We advise you to either pull that break down to bring your kite down, or if you really must, um, hit that top pad and do a self rescue. Cause we'd rather come and get you than have to wrestle a kite in the tree. And if we want to be honest with you, especially with these foil kites, if you get your kite stuck in the tree, the tree will usually always win. And at that point, you have to fully detach and try to fish it out of there. I've only had one instance where I've seen somebody get it stuck in the tree and be able to pull it out. Also, like when you're kiting, you'll see a lot of people with helmets. I never winter kite without a helmet. I just know that if I run into something, I'm going to hit my head somehow. Another um pieces of equipment that people will wear are also knee pads and elbow pads, especially on a snowboard. If you do fall forward, you're going to be hitting your knees a lot. Or even another tip is um, to add a little bit more cushion under your snow pants if you're snowboarding too, just to give um, some more cushion on your butt as well. It's a, an interesting sport for uh, videotaping 
and the drone uh, capturing video uh, while kites are in the sky, you would not want to knock the drone out of the sky with your kite. But uh, Henry Elholm and Tim Comfort, their students who were literally learning to pilot or to fly the drone while kiters are piloting their kites in close proximity. And they thought they were just gonna videotape while standing there. And they quickly learned that the best video capture happens when they're holding onto a water ski rope behind the snowmobile and filming on skis all at the same time. So there's a lot of connections and uh, career development. Um, you know, these are students, uh, undergrad, grad students working with professional staff. And we're really proud when uh, someone graduates and they acquire their own kites and they come back out and they ride with us. Uh, the, that level of mentorship they're providing to the younger riders is very important. When kiting to and showing up, you always want water and a snack because I can't tell you how many people that have come out without water and end up drinking all of mine. Usually a water bottle is enough, but some people, especially if you're adventure kiting or something, will wear a camelback on their back. That's why they don't have to come in for water. They can just sip and drink. So now just a little bit of background on me. So how I got into kiting is it all started with my dad. He saw people water kiting down in Florida, got really into it, ended up stopping and talking to the kiters as they came in. And when he came back to Minnesota, he actually took lessons on Mille Lacs Lake. And from there, he taught my sister and then taught my brother as well. So when I was 12, I, um, you know, that's when I first started learning and I had lessons both from my brother and dad and my brother ended up progressing and coming to UMD and was also a snow instructor for Randy. So the baton was kind of passed for me. One thing to note too is I also, I officially started kiting on the snow, which I think is very helpful, especially if you do want to get into water kiting. Um, while being on snow, you don't have to worry about any of the other factors that you do with water kiting. Like sometimes you kind of feel like you're drowning or something while trying to uh, fly. So with on the snow, you know, you can sit, you can focus on your kite, focus on like your movements, your turns, like how you're flying, like all of your piloting skills and really perfecting them. And another thing to note too, is if you are on a snowboard on the snow, that is also very similar to riding a wakeboard on the water. And so just learning those skills of, you know, edging on the water is the same as edging on the snow and, you know, just attempting to ride upwind is very common. So if we wanted to continue with the video and also my um, skills of kiting has progressed to now, I am also buying my own kites and I'm going on my own kite trips too along without, um, anybody else to teach me. And so here you can just see me snowboarding. Obviously um, skiing when first learning is preferred and it's a lot easier to learn, but if you only have snowboards or you just really wanna learn on the snowboard, that's okay too. So obviously you mainly ride heel edge when kiting. It does burn your thighs. So there are instances like right here will, where you will go toe edge. And then if you want to transition into a heel edge, you can as well. But yep, so you know, you mainly bend those knees, dig in with those heels, and that's how you ride with that. And so, you know, just growing up snowboarding um, or kiting and stuff too, especially in Minnesota, there's not as many female riders here as well, especially young female riders. I can't tell you how many times I've been out to Mille Lacs and like, you definitely get some attention just because not only are you the only young female rider, like you're the only out there in general. And so one way I've been trying to combat this is um, incorporating some of my friends into this. And we've been really intentional and welcoming and stuff. And I think sometimes just making sure that like this is a sport for everybody really helps as well too. So my friend Quinn has been going through and she's been continuing and oh my gosh, you can just see at this, like how stoked she is on her face every time she goes out for a session. She started off, you know, 
kind of worried. I think there's a few instances where the kite really pulled her and she had to be humbled and it scared her a little. But she pushed through and she continued because she saw this was something that she wanted to do. And that's the thing about kiting is it's not always easy as at first, but the more you push and the more you are willing to learn and actually listen and be intentional about like, you know, your progression, like you will succeed and break through. And that's just how she did too. I like the look on her face, like you see it on everybody's face is the first good session they have or the first time they do a successful cross run reach. They just come back with their eyes light up, face smiling, like it's a great feeling. But just keep in mind too, like even though like you'll try to rope everybody in, you know, some people, it's just not always for them and they can't always stick to that and it's totally okay. But the people that do stick with it, like they absolutely love it and they continue it for as long as they can. It seems like we get a lot of uh, engineering students involved with the winter kiteboarding program. They like the complexity of, of the equipment uh, and the sport in general. The uh, <clears throat> opportunity to travel and bring these kites to a mountain uh, destination above 9,000 feet, there's a lot of rolling mountain terrain deep snow. So we'll go to the Bighorn Mountains uh, or Mount Hagen. Uh, these are Wyoming and Montana locations. And there you have to be aware of wind shadow uh, effects on your kite and just dealing with sloping terrain. But the practice we do to develop instinctive uh, piloting and skiing and snowboarding techniques on the lake uh, help a lot. It, uh, you have to take your knowledge and turn it into muscle memory and have some instinctive movements because it's pretty fast sport. So at the end of a, a session, people uh, head back to their, their cars and um, kiters will wrap up their kite. So they're coming back to the launch area where there is a ice screw and maybe little a section of line and a carabiner. If you pull the brake, land the kite, attach the carabiner to the brake, we've now achieved ground control at that carabiner. And we can detach ourselves, our leash from the chicken loop or wherever that leash uh, attaches to your bar, depending on your system. And it's not a bad plan to go to your kite and grab a wingtip so that you can reduce your footprint on the surface, cut it in half. So I've grabbed the right wingtip. I keep the kite so the belly is facing up, bring it back towards the ice group, put some snow on the upwing side of it. That's called flagging out your kite. And then you can have uh, ground control of the kite, allowing you to wrap the lines up on the bar in the shape of a figure eight. And so then it's back to the leading edge of the kite, uh, holding it down with your knees and folding it in chunks, roughly just a little wider than your bar. So if it's quite windy, you're using your knees to control the kite and you're folding it up to the halfway point. This is why I like having the knee pads on. You know, I'm kind of crawling around there. Then you grab the downwind wing, wingtip, fold it in half, and we're coming towards the end of folding the kite. At this point, you can bring your bar to the kite and you put the uh, trimmer strap and chicken loop and brake towards the leading edge. Then there's the bar, leader lines, and your bridles get tucked into the trailing edge of the kite. The objective here is to have all those bridles captured by the fabric when you roll it up so then they can't get tangled because they're pinned. There's a strap that goes around the kite and you notice um, that backpack is going to be attached to our ice screw, which is a strategy if we're sharing kites and we want to mark the ice screw. In blowing snow, it would be really easy to lose track of where you put that ice screw in the ice. 
So we'll use the backpack to mark it. And there's a little leash there in case the snow is deep. In this case, that leash wouldn't be needed. But the cap has to be put back on that ice screw. The end of that ice screw, those teeth are very sharp. Now in the mountains, you wouldn't be able to put an ice screw into the ice. You would have to use snow for ground control, putting snow on your kite. And so the methods do change depending on your setting. But the kite goes back in the bag and if we've done a good job wrapping it up, it will be ready to launch at the next session. Um, so we'll take the carabiner and ice crew and our skis back to the sled um, behind the snowmobile. So we have a lot of equipment to choose from. It's kind of like a bag of golf clubs. You pick the right uh, club for the right shot. And so we make sure people are on the right equipment uh, when they come out and join us. Well, thank you, Randy and Anna, for that demonstration. And um, now we're going to turn on our videos and we'll get started with the question and answer. All right. So we've had a few questions come in. Um, but as a reminder, if you'd like to submit live questions, just use the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen. So the first question is wondering, how many kites does UMD have? There are about 35 or 40 kites in the inventory, and some are 20 years old. So if you take good care of them, they can last a while. Keep in mind, like the kites, you crash the kite in the beginning. Uh, it, you just have to learn about the delay in the steering, and it's common to do that. But as you progress, you want to try to keep that kite flying. Some of these kites are $500 kites. Others are $1,500 kites. So it's good to experience the sport before you run out and buy a bunch of kites. Your first kite that you buy might be a, like an eight meter uh, open cell foil kite. And so that's gonna set, set you back about a thousand bucks for that one. And we actually just- yeah, okay. question, sorry, come in. Um, if they want it, if you're interested in buying a kite, um, what should you look for? And maybe you could answer that, Anna. Wait, sorry, what was the question? The question was, if you'd like to buy a kite, what should a person look for? Um, I guess it, it kind of depends on also like their setting that they're in and their weight. Um, so obviously if you are looking for a kite that you can also take on water, like you want it to do both, that's usually when the leading edge inflatable is in. Cause if you try to use a open cell foil on the water, um, it, and you drop it, it's not really going to come up as easy or at all. So obviously the type of kite matters, even with that, um, it's a lot of research you have to do and it's a lot of your liking it's a lot of how much money you're willing to spend and with the brands too and um for instance if you're looking for a kite to fly um you know in the winter in duluth you may look for a foil kite on average like around like a size 10 you know or if you're looking for something more on water, um, maybe it also depends on your size again. But in Minnesota, I think a 12 or a 10 is also, maybe a 12 is kind of a good average it can, but it, it's so very, like, it depends on your size. It depends on, you know, the environment again, like water, wind, stuff like that. So everything's situational which is kind of broad, I'm sorry, but everything is, it's your research, it's, you know, your own preferences, body types, um, stuff like that. But some kite brands are better than others and some years within those kite brands are better than others too. It's a smart thing to keep in mind too, too when looking. It would be safe to say that you will need more than one kite to be successful. And if you buy a used kite, you have to be aware of UV damage to the fabric and the lines. And if the lines are stretched, um, you know, you need to tune those lines so that your kite 
works properly. So buying a used kite is, is, has its own challenges, uh, but they can be overcome if you have an ally, someone who has experience to help you um, make that selection and make sure the kite is working properly. That helps a lot. So then as far as kite maintenance goes, do you have to dry the kites out after packing them up? That's a great question. For winter use, I keep the kites in cold storage because if there's some snow on the kite and I bring it indoors, it melts while it's rolled up and then refreezes once I bring them back outside. So cold storage is best. If you bring them inside, yes, you would have to open up the kite and dry it out every time. Uh, so yeah, there are many maintenance uh, aspects to keep track of. So we're going to shift a little bit towards safety. And we had a question wondering, would you recommend a life vest to protect the, your ribs in the event of a fall and any other safety equipment that you would recommend? Um, I'd say for sure go to would be a helmet and that's the same for water and snow kiting as well. Um, they do make like water helmets and I see plenty of kiters using those. I've never personally used a life vest while kiting um, with certain harnesses like waist harnesses. If you do wear a vest like that, it gets in the way. But um, with seat harnesses that are more around your butt, um, I think if you wanted to, it would help. There is something called impact vest too as well, which you will see people use on the water. And that's um, just a vest that you put on that um, is more designed for kiting. So if you do have a waist harness, they do make those that um, fit more to those. And with those, it's not a full out life jacket but it has a little bit of padding to it. So it does protect you and it adds just like a little bit more flotation, but nothing similar to like a traditional like life jacket or anything like that. I'd add a couple of things to that. You know, in the mid Atlantic coast or down South Padre, Texas, there's sand and it's quite shallow, you know, for quite a ways off, off the beach. On Lake Superior, it gets deep quickly and the water is quite cold. So the buoyancy of my wetsuit and then I do have a life jacket that I wear comes in handy. Um, cold water kiteboarding is a whole different ball game uh, on Lake Superior. And so I, I like to be cautious about that in case I do have a longer unwanted swim. So we had a question about training and wondering, does it take more upper or lower body strength? Um, I'd say for me personally, definitely lower body. Cause um, especially on the snowboard, like how I was saying, like you are heel edging a lot. My thighs have burnt out so much where sometimes you, you know, it's kind of silly if you watch it, but I'll just kind of sit early on my back and fly the kite around just to, you know, give my legs a little break. I was like, another way to combat it is people will then transition to toe side to switch it up more. But I'd say for me personally, my thighs kill the most of anything, like no matter what, even on the water too sometimes. What about you, Randy? You know, some kites, they have more bar pressure than others. Uh, but yeah, without a doubt, it's your legs that get fatigued much faster than your upper body. And that holds true for snow kiting or water kiting. You know, usually there's swell with boogie water chop on top of it on Lake Superior. So your legs are just always working. So wondering about equipment again, um, is there a type of ski that works best or will alpine skis work? Yeah, your, your skis that are wider and softer, like powder skis, work the best. Uh, so your variable terrain, I, I ride more on soft snow with winter kiteboarding than I, than I would if I had a season pass to a ski area. So I like a little wider 
um, ski uh, that's softer and has some rocker in the tip and tail. Are you the same, Anna? Um, I snowboard, so I, I don't know. I've never had like the greatest board or anything. I've kind of just gone with whatever I've had and made it work. So if, you know, you can't afford to spend money on like any of like the perfect equipment, that's okay too. Um, I'd say for, if you are snowboarding, um, kind of your feet placement kind of would be something to focus on if you're not looking to getting like the most like exact board or anything. And that's just kind of, um, you know, it's going to be different than when you're going down uh, like a hill or anything like that as well. But you're going to want your feet to like not completely duck feet, but still like a little bit angle. And you're just going to kind of go and want to be wide and a little bit of duck feet. And that's just kind of like your stance and stuff on a snowboard. And your will be a, a true twin tip snowboard because you're riding to the left as much as you're riding to the right. So a true twin tip, 12 degree duck stance, and you're good to go. Well, for beginners who are just starting out um, kiting, uh, are there any classes or anything that UMD offers locally um, for people in the twin ports? And if not, where would you recommend people to um, you know, learn more about the sport? So the challenge is in November, December, January, February, daylight. Uh, so we have to chase the wind when we have daylight. And hopefully that happens on weekends, but I'll go on Wednesdays, Thursdays, or Fridays. Uh, so if, if your location that your winter kiteboarding is close to where you live, that helps. Because you want to get at least four or five hours of riding in the daylight. Um, there at UMD, I set it up as a, a pass for the entire winter season, and we'll get out a dozen times in a winter season. Um, if you live in the Twin Cities area, there are uh, kiteboarding instructors that you can uh, refer to with uh, Lake Area Kite and Windsurf Association or Dynamic Kiteboarding. They, they will take you to those local lakes down there to start out because it's it's hard to drive all the way up to Duluth and then drive all the way back to the Twin Cities, um, although people have done it. So try to access your local community resources as best you can. And is that pass, Randy, is that available to community members as well? Yeah, it is. Um, I think it's priced at $135 for the winter and it's group style instruction for students. It's $65. So it's, it's priced low. Um, and my expectations is that people will uh, help each other share the equipment, you know, as a more collective experience. Oftentimes people will get private instruction uh, for this sport. That's the most common format. But you will need someone that's looking out for you uh, when you start this sport. And I think our last question that we'll end on are maybe a few stories from each one of you of your favorite kiting experience. Um, you can each share one. So we'll start with you, Anna. Um, I guess mine would probably be when I was in the Dominican water kiting. Um, it was so like pretty and everything and like the environment there, like everybody was super friendly and looking out for each other all the time, but I loved it because I ended up getting some really good sessions and, and being lighter as someone as myself, I was the person that I could be out there earlier than everybody. And then once the wind actually picked up, then I'd hand the kite off to my dad. And then once the kite, once the wind died down, I could go out again just because like, you know, I could last out there and a lot longer than a lot of people but I'd say my favorite thing about that was obviously the waves are super fun so jumping off of those but I think the best thing was there's sea turtles everywhere so as you're kiting and stuff that you had like just these massive sea turtles just swimming right next to you and they just like unbothered and you know I think that was probably the coolest thing was seeing those out there. 
super cool. What about you, Randy? You know, I'd have to say I, I love the winter and uh, in the Bighorn Mountains with the sun setting to the west and you're in high alpine terrain and deep snow, that's a pretty uh, magical moment. Um, just the view, the length of the view, you can see 100 miles away to the next mountain range and you're being propelled by a kite uh, through the powder. That's, that's a pretty special moment. Awesome. Well, thank you both for taking the time um, to share with all of us a little bit about the sport. Um, with that, thank you both so much. And we hope thank to see you again soon. Take care. Have a good day.